Hi guys, have you bought a sundew or are you looking at buying a sundew and aren't really sure how to look after it? Or are you unsure about the information that you found online? Well, today with these six easy steps that I use, I will be able to get your plant from looking like this to looking like this. Stick around. So if you don't know, this is a sundew or scientifically known as a drosera. It has sticky leaves, as you can see, and they are actually plants, just like a Venus flytrap, that catches and digests insects. So these plants are actually quite well known. Darwin did some of his scientific research on the Drosera, and he thinks that they are one of the most interesting plants in the world. So if you aren't sure about what this channel is, this is a channel dedicated to the care and cultivation of carnivorous plants with over 10 years of carnivorous plants growing experience. So if this is what you're interested in, make sure that you subscribe and click the notifications button so that you may receive a video every single week and don't miss any of the content that we provide. So if you still aren't sure about what a sundew is, it's a carnivorous plant that grows in boglands or wetlands where there's slow moving waters moving below their roots. This moves any nutrients that do arise in the soil which causes the plant to actually lose any ability to pick up these nutrients and grow. This is why they actually evolve these sticky traps to catch insects that fly around in the environment that this plant grows in. Well this raises the question, how do we emulate the environment that these plants grow in? Well I use these six simple steps to look after the drosera. These steps include the amount of sun that the plants need, the amount of water that they need and the type of water, dormancy periods, the soil substrate that they need, the amounts of humidity that the plants need and also when and how to feed your carnivorous plant. So if you've watched my Venus flytrap care guide, which you can actually click here to watch it, you may know that I used to stare at my plants every single second of every single hour when I first get them. I can tell you now that I don't do that anymore, but it's still very interesting to watch these plants trap and digest any insects that land on the leaves. And I actually spend so much time just watching the plants that I didn't actually think about what kind of environment that I needed to put the plants into. So before I buy a sundew, I always do some research to figure out how much sunlight the specific drosera will need. And I always make sure that I buy the plant from a reputable grower. That means someone that I trust who knows how to grow the plants and someone that I can get as much information about how much sunlight they provide to the plants so that I can try and copy the amount of sunlight that they gave to the plant to the amount of sunlight that I can give to the plants so that the plant does well under my care. I always try to give the plant six to eight hours of direct sunlight. And if I'm unable to do that, I try to put the plant in a position with a lot of bright sunlight. In my grow space, I have a shade net that covers the span of the area which my sundews actually grow in. This just shows that you don't actually need bright, direct, intense lights all the time. Just bright light is enough for them. And just ensuring that your plant gets around eight hours of sunlight per day means that your sundew will do really well. Now these plants need to have a specific type of water, distilled water, reverse osmosis water or rainwater. Now what does these types of waters all have in common? What they have in common is that none of them have a lot of minerals inside of the water. So these plants in the wild, they will obviously only get rainwater which is very low in mineral concentrations. Which means that we have to try to copy that by using these three types of water. Now in summer I generally give the plants about one to two inches of water in the tray that I grow them in and in winter time I give them about one inch and less of water throughout the day. This is just to ensure that there's a fluctuation of water between the two periods and that the plant doesn't actually rot away during the winter time. Now it's very important to know that the height of the pot does take into consideration how much water you need to give the plant. If I'm using a pot this size Giving it about an, an inch to two inches of water would be fine. But if I'm using a plant, plant which is in a pot this hot, giving about one inch to two inches of water may be too little. And if I'm using a pot that is this size, putting two inches of water will be way too much. So ensuring that you provide the right amount of water for your plant is very important. If you're using a small pot like this, you want to have about half of the pot's height to about a quarter of the pot's height of water during the summer and in winter a quarter of the height to letting the tray dry out between waterings 
while you water them in winter time. That leads us on to the next tip, dormancy. So what exactly does that mean? In winter time, many of the carnivorous plants go dormant. So if you're growing a plant like the scapensis here, you may wonder why doesn't it go dormant? And that brings up the point. Some plants don't even need dormancy. So how do we know which plants those are? Well, it's very simple. Plants such as the capensis is a subtropical plant, and some people may even call them a tropical plant. And these plants are known to grow throughout the year. Some other plants, such as Drosera bonata, doesn't actually need to stay. Now, some plants such as Drosera bonata go dormant in winter time, which means that they form a small hibernaculum in which the plant actually falls asleep. Now, if a plant is dormant, such as the bonata, we need to ensure that you give them less water as I said earlier, to ensure that the plant doesn't rot away during winter. But then you may ask, how do I know which plant goes dormant? Well, if you don't want to do the research, you can keep the plant in water and when winter time comes around, you can see if it starts actually going to sleep. Then you'll know, okay, this is a plant that, in, that needs dormancy. But if you want to do the research, there are many sites online, such as the International Carnivorous Plant Society website, which gives you a lot of information about all of the different types of carnivorous plants that there are in the world. It is also important to note that during dormancy, the plants that do go dormant need to have less sunlight as well. So just like you would have less sunlight in winter, you need to give the less plants sunlight in winter while they're dormant. If you're using grow lights, it would be wise of you to put the, the lights on a timer or to switch off the lights earlier in winter and then leave the lights on for longer in summer. This is just to copy the photo periods that you get in summer compared to winter. Now let's talk a bit about humidity. If you've been growing carnivorous plants for a while, you may have heard this term being thrown around. Humidity, you need to give the plant a lot of humidity. This plant doesn't have enough humidity. But why do people talk about humidity so much? Well, it's a, actually a very important thing to talk about for many of the carnivorous plants. Some plants such as Drosera count on a lot of humidity to cause the leaves to actually become very globular and to allow the, these leaves to be efficient in actually capturing insects. Since I brought this plant out, many of the leaves have actually stopped being sticky. And this is because the greenhouse that I'm in is actually hotter than what it is used to. Outside it is very cold, being winter in South Africa, it's around 18 degrees Celsius right now. And inside of this greenhouse, it's easily about 25 degrees Celsius and much less humid because of that. And that just shows that all of the globules that is on the drosera have evaporated away now which shows that humidity does play an important role. But I wouldn't say that it's important to ensure that you provide the perfect humidity at every single moment in the plant's life. So what do I mean by that? Well, I mean that you don't have to put the plant in a tank outside. I mean that allowing the plant to adapt to the environment that you provide it will allow the plant to actually grow in such a way to live in that environment. So by no means do I mean now go out and buy a fargo or something. I just mean that humidity is important, but don't think it's the end all of growing carnivorous plants. But obviously, humidity is important for some plants such as Nepenthes. Those plants do need a lot of humidity in to ensure that the pitches actually grow well. But plants such as Drosera and Venus flytraps, they don't actually need such a high amounts of humidity. Here in South Africa, where I stay, it is actually not humid at all. It's around 10% relative humidity in winter and up to around 50% humidity in summertime. So it just shows you that you don't have to worry too much about humidity for these plants. Now let's talk about soil. I use a very simple mix to grow all of my drosera in. I use a mixture of one, this to one, of peat and silica sand. Now I use silica sand in that it is actually much easier to grow your plants in compared to perlite. And the reason why I say this is because when you use perlite and you flood the pot, the perlite floats to the top and it doesn't look really nice at all. And it also removes any benefits that the perlite may have to actually aerate the soil. That's why I use silica sand because silica sand doesn't float and will actually stay inside of the media and allow for lots of aeration inside of the soil. Some people have a lot of success in growing in long fiber sphagnum moss or live sphagnum moss. And if it works for you, go for it. But I've never been able to actually use long fiber sphagnum as there isn't a great availability of it in my country. Now let's talk about feeding. If you have a carnivorous plant, you may want to see it feed all the time, which may make you want to feed it all the time. And it's actually important to know that these plants don't actually need to be fed often at all, actually. They're very capable of catching insects by themselves. But 
you know we want to see them eat bugs that's why we grow these plants so if you want to feed it an insect I recommend that you give it a live insect you can catch a fly catch a fruit fly catch an ant whatever you want really whatever's around you and put it onto the leaf make sure that it is alive as this is the most important part of actually feeding your insects the movement of the struggling insects is what causes the leaves to curl around the insect and if it's not moving that means that the drosera has no idea that there's actually an insect on the leaf so if you do want to feed it make sure that you're feeding it a live insect and also remember it's not very important to do so so if you've made it this far in the video let me ask you a question what kind of plant is closing its leaves in the next clip I'm about to play let me know in the comments below and if you get it right then I'll pin you and if you found this video helpful please leave a like Stopped asking for forgiveness Cause you should know Only fools tread with the angels Fear to go But you keep trying to get too close Save myself by turning into stone So save your judgment Cause you just don't know But some things never change Never change Oh They say I should feel guilty And change my ways Leave them come for bodies In my way where I didn't mean to make them break Where I didn't mean to make them break But they're so delicate and so mundane And they keep coming like a moth to a flame Oh, some things never change, never change So if you 